Le fettuccine all'Alfredo nascono nel lontano 1908, quando il mio bisnonno Alfredo Di Lelio le preparò per sua moglie Ines, la quale aveva appena partorito in casa mio nonno. La fama delle fettuccine all'Alfredo eh, avvenne nel 1927. Andarono i due attori famosi del cinema muto, Mary Pickford e Douglas Fairbanks. Erano a Roma per la luna di miele e regalarono ad Alfredo un cucchiaio di una forchetta d'oro con scritto Tu Alfredo, The King of the Noodle. Da quel momento tutte le star di Hollywood volevano venire a Roma per mangiare le fettuccine con le posate d'oro e le fettuccine all'Alfredo divennero famose in tutto il mondo. You know, the story of fettuccine Alfredo usually starts in Rome, where there are two restaurants and they prepare a cheese and butter laden version of this dish, mostly for tourists and celebrities. But on a recent trip to Italy, we're taught that the true origins of the dish actually go back to something very simple. It's called pancia sconvolta, made by mothers for their sick kids. So today at Milk Street, we make the lighter, more authentic fettuccine Alfredo. Plus, we demonstrate a lemon garlic fettuccine from Amalfi, and then our favorite recipe for chocolate biscotti. Please stay tuned. Funding for this series was provided by the following. That meal. You sauteed, you seared, and you served. Cooking with Allclad. Bonded cookware designed, engineered, and assembled in the USA for over 50 years. Allclad. For all your kitchen adventures. Benvenuto nella mia cucina. Quando vuoi, se vuoi possiamo entrare. La pasta all'alfredo è una pasta parmigiano e burro con fettuccine all'uovo rispetto alla pasta burro e parmigiano. La pasta alfredo ha questa cremina che si forma proprio dalla risottatura. Non a caso bisogna mettere pochissima acqua prima di buttare la pasta, ok? Allora, mettiamo adesso un pochino di sale nella pasta, ripeto, poco rispetto alle, alle normali paste da fare, proprio perché altrimenti verrebbe troppo salata quando si riduce il volume dell'acqua a bollore. Nel frattempo sciogliamo il burro in una padella, a fuoco però piccolissimo, buttiamo la pasta perché sta bollendo l'acqua, Ah, ecco, nel frattempo bisogna già mettere nella padella dove c'è il burro fuso un pochino di questa acqua. Ok, adesso possiamo cominciare a scolare la pasta da qua e la mettiamo qua. Adesso abbiamo messo un altro mestolo di, di acqua qui perché sta formando la cremina, non so se si vede, piano piano, vedi piano piano, perché rilascia tutto l'amido nella padella, vedi questa crema che viene, che è pazzesca, tu pensa adesso quando ci metto il parmigiano, bene, adesso si spenge il fuoco, via, chiuso, fuoco spento, una manciata di parmigiano, e si continua a girare perché deve incorporare aria ammazza è venuta fantastica te lo dico <ride> perfetto è fatta adesso la impiattiamo ok ecco qua questa è la pasta all'alfredo cremosissima ma solo burro e parmigiano, non c'è nient'altro. 
L'importante è la mantecatura, lo dirò fino alla morte. Ecco qua. Fettuccine Alfredo is really my favorite recipe of all time. I love the origin story, I love what it is, I love what it's not, and I also love the fact that it has two great techniques you can use in lots of different pasta recipes. So it's not the recipe you find at those two restaurants in Rome. Those have tons of butter and tons of cheese. They're unctuous, they really overdo it. This is a recipe that goes back hundreds of years in Italy. It's what mothers make for their kids when they have a tummy ache, and it does have pasta with butter and cheese, but it's a little bit leaner, more digestible, and actually a fabulous recipe. So we are gonna start with butter. You know, it's not just a couple tablespoons, it's a stick of butter. And you wanna put pieces uh, at the bottom and around the bowl that you're gonna toss the pasta in. And you want the butter to be very soft because when that hot pasta hits it and the hot water, the cooking water, it's gonna to wanna to emulsify and start to create a sauce. And you want a pretty good sized bowl too because you're gonna to be tossing this pasta quite a lot. The second thing is you really want a fairly high fat butter. Very often in this country, uh, brands of butter might be 81% butter fat, something like that. Some of the European brands are more 85 or 86%. It does make a difference. So you do want to go out and get a higher butter fat content brand. So we have the butter sitting there. Now we have the Parmesan. You obviously want the real thing because it's so important to the flavor. This is six ounces of Parmesan and we're just going to cut that into some chunks and we're gonna use about two thirds of it right in the sauce. All right, now we're gonna pulse this. You want it fairly fine because what's gonna happen is we toss that cooked pasta with the butter and the cheese. You don't want that cheese to melt. So that's the cheese, it's finely ground and that'll be fine enough so it actually melts and emulsifies into the sauce. So we're gonna use a teaspoon and a half of kosher salt. Here is the first part of the technique that I think is so important. We're cooking two nine ounce packages of fettuccine in only two quarts of water, eight cups of water. The reason is the starch is given off by that fresh pasta is gonna be concentrated because there's half as much water as you normally would use. And that starch in that cooking liquid is gonna be really important to emulsifying the sauce. In essence, we're building a sauce from the cooking water. So let's drop the pasta. And fresh pasta, as you know, cooks in just two or three minutes. You wanna watch it pretty carefully. That's why you wanna have the butter ready and the cheese ready to go. Okay, now we're going to turn off the heat and we're gonna add the pasta. But what we're gonna do is add it along with some of the water it comes with it. We're not gonna drain it because we want some of that pasta water in the bowl to help melt the butter. Now we start uh, tossing the pasta. Let me add a little bit of water to it. So the second part of this, the technique, besides using less water, which is starchy, is, and we watched when we cooked at home, what she did was to toss for quite a long time. Uh, and it's that tossing which helps to build the sauce and emulsify the sauce. Normally at home, most of us would toss pasta with sauce for maybe 10 seconds. She actually tossed it for two or three minutes. The butter's now melted. It started to emulsify and become a sauce. Now we're gonna start adding the cheese. And we should have about a cup and a half of grated cheese right now. I'm gonna start adding it, about a cup of it in a third cup increments. And you're also gonna to wanna to start adding a little bit more pasta water just to create a sauce. And although we have six ounces of cheese and a stick of butter, that's way less uh, than you'll find at uh, those restaurants in Rome. So a little more of the water. Now it's really starting to come together. Okay, now we're gonna let it sit for another two minutes. Uh, I just have to wait two minutes. We'll check the texture. We might add a little more water and then we're good to go. So um, this is the Italian pasta twirling trick. <laughs> we'll see how it works. We use a large ladle. pretty well, look at that. So it's a little trick for plating the pasta and a little bit of cheese on top. So let me take a taste. Even though my stomach's fine. Oh, 
It's so good. And it's light. It's not heavy like a fettuccine Alfredo at one of those Roman restaurants. So that's our recipe for fettuccine Alfredo. The real recipe that goes back hundreds of years. Cheese, butter, pasta, and salt. Made quickly, not too much cooking water, and toss for a couple minutes to really emulsify the sauce. It's delicious and actually, it tastes light as well. Every now and then you come across those recipes that kind of stay with you for the rest of your life. When, from the moment you came across it, you keep making it. And this is one of those recipes. My daughters have me all figured out. Every year around the holidays, about a month in advance, they start saying, oh, mom, we're so looking forward to those biscotti you make. We can't wait to have them. Of course, then I don't have an option but to make them every Smart year. kids. Yeah. We were inspired by a recipe from Maida Heater from her book, The Best Dessert Book Ever, published in the 70s. A modest title, we should add. Modest. So I've made this recipe for about 30 years and have made little changes over the years, but have kept it mostly the same in okay. terms of technique. So we'll start by mixing the dry ingredients. We have the all-purpose flour here. We'll add the sugar. We're adding cocoa powder here. Cocoa powder is what makes the biscotti chocolate biscotti, but we're also going to add bittersweet chocolate. So we have a little bit of salt in there, a little bit of baking soda, and this is instant espresso powder. Espresso powder. Yeah. And as you know, it doesn't make the biscotti taste like coffee. There's very little here. But what this does is boost the chocolate flavor. Kind of gives it, rounds out the edge of it. Okay, good. And if you, sir, would mind chopping that eight ounces of bittersweet chocolate over there. Uh, we would like half of it in large chunks. Why did I ask? <laughs> Great. And half of it in a quarter inch I, pieces. I knew there would be enough right. like that. Look at okay. that. Oh, perfect. Look at that. Now, this is a big chunk of chocolate. This is a, we bought it in bulk, but you can get chocolate bars, the same thing. Just look for a really good quality chocolate bar that you like eating, and that's the one to use. You want to avoid chocolate chips in this recipe because those have additives in them that help them hold their shape together, and we want a nice, meltable chocolate. This is in Maida Hita's recipe as well that I thought was just brilliant. She takes this cocoa infused dry mixture mm -hmm. and then puts more bittersweet chocolate in it and grinds it together. So you're actually infusing the dough with that pure bittersweet chocolate as well as cocoa powder. And that's why these actually taste like chocolate biscotti. Thank you. Would you put that in there? So we put about a half a cup of the dry mixture in there. More or less is okay. And we're gonna let this process until it's completely smooth and pulverized. You can kind of hear when it's ready, when the chocolate pieces don't clang against the bowl anymore. Okay, so we'll add that back in. So much of baking seems to be about mixing all the dry ingredients together and all the wet ingredients together and then bringing them. That's what we're going to do now. Three eggs. Three eggs. Touch of almond extract. Vanilla. Your favorite. Yes and just make those smooth. Now that is the entire amount of liquid that's going to go into these biscotti. All right, good. We're gonna start mixing this. At some point, the eggs are gonna get completely absorbed into this, and it will feel as if it's way too dry and that it will never come together, but it will. You just have to trust in the biscotti, and then start pressing. Okay, resist the urge to add water. I would have already <laughs> been in for about a quarter cup of water right. at this point, or oil. So we'll add the four ounces of chocolate that you just chopped. We'll also add some almonds that have been lightly roasted to increase their flavor. So those few little adaptations you make along the way, if one of the things I added was a little bit more of the chopped chocolate in the dough, not just the chocolate that was blended in, and I added the pistachios for color. Also added a little bit of dried cherry to the dough because I was looking for something around the holidays. Was this Especially. clean out the pantry day <laughs> at the Bianca household? Well, it just shows that this is one of those recipes you can add the things you like. The thing to remember though that's important here is the ratio. Whatever the volume of the recipe is for all these things total, don't go beyond that because it will disrupt the dough too much okay. and it won't hold together. Okay, so now we have to get in there with our hands. That's really the only way. We're gonna use our hands in a minute anyway, so this is okay. Okay, so this has a couple more minutes of uh, mixing together and then we'll be ready to shape the logs. See, it came together and you don't think it will. So we're going to divide this into two logs and the dough is going to bake in those logs before we slice it into individual biscotti. Okay, you get one, I get one. Instead of using flour to shape the logs, which you would normally do, that creates sort of like a dusty surface on the outside. I don't like the way it looks, but just use a little bit of water to make your palms 
slightly damp. Yeah. And then we will press this into a log shape. 14 inch long log. See how stiff and thick the dough is? But very pliable, very malleable. It's holding together even with all those chunky ingredients in it. And that's why you don't want too many chunky ingredients. So is that 14? No, I think that's like 13. <laughs> this, that's the story of my life. <laughs> is it good? No. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> we'll put them both on the sheet tray, about four inches apart. You'd be surprised. These change drastically in the oven. They poof up, they spread out, and they get crackly on top. It's pretty mm. cool. So 375 for the logs to bake, about 45 to 50 minutes. Then they cool for a brief amount of time before we slice them. They go back into a lower oven and to finish baking. Okay. So they're still warm or? They are. 15 to 20 minutes. You don't want to slice them when they're hot but you don't wanna let them cool down completely because then they get too crunchy to slice. So they're still warm and you can see how they spread out a little bit. The crackly surface on top is perfect, not a mistake. I will very carefully transfer this to you. But the trick here first is how to slice them. So you can try sawing and then pushing through at the bottom. And you wanna cut them about a half an inch thick. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. You can try the knife straight or at an angle. Whatever works is the method you stick with. So you're probably gonna sacrifice a few slices to start, but that's okay. We'll put these cut side down. And then you have that beautiful pattern of the nuts and the pistachios and the almonds facing up. Okay, these have had their first baking as a log. We turned the oven down to 275 when those logs came out. And now the slices go in at 275 for about 20 minutes while they finish crisping up. Look what we made. Cheers. Well, wait a minute. This is not Vino Santo or something. I mean, it this is be. coffee. Because these are so deeply chocolate, the sweet dessert wine isn't the only thing they'll go good with. I mean, bourbon. Well, bourbon's not bad. I, bourbon goes with everything. Right? Yeah. Right. Whatever. <laughs> so. Right? Mmm. Oh. Crunchy, but not hard, right? Well, there, there are two problems with biscotti. They're too hard and you break a tooth on them. Mm -hmm. Or they're too sandy and- Ooh, crumbly. Crumbly, they're like shortbread. Right. Uh, but this is good because it's got some tooth to it, but it's not so hard you can't bite it. Right. So chocolate biscotti and you added pistachio almonds and tart cherries. We should thank Maida Heater yes. because uh, we were very much inspired by her for this recipe, many other recipes. And thank you uh, for sharing 30 years of biscotti experience <laughs> here on Milk Street. They're supposed to last a long time, but I don't think they will. I'll split that with you. Okay. Okay. Back in Amalfi, Italy, Giovanna Aceto showed us this really beautiful lemon pasta dish that was sauteed in a very simple garlic sauce. Now, we're gonna try and recreate the same thing here, and while we don't have Amalfi lemons, we do have a couple tricks up our sleeve to kind of recreate that flavor. So it all starts with using lemons in multiple different ways, and it starts with our zest. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use a Y-style peeler, and we're going to peel the zest off of these lemons in big, long strips. And you wanna do this to two lemons, and that way we can really maximize all of that lemon zest flavor. Now, while you're peeling, you want to avoid getting any of that white bitter pith, because we'll be eating these zest pieces, and therefore, if we get that bitterness now, we're gonna get that bitterness later. Now, it's really important, while you're working with lemons from the States, be sure to wash them first. So now from here, we'll go ahead and take all of our zest and we're gonna throw it into two quarts of water that we brought up to a boil. And we'll also follow that up with some salt and a little interesting ingredient, some sugar. So now we're gonna get to working on our next layer of lemon flavor, which involves cutting the lemon up, but not just the whole lemon, we just want the segments. So we're gonna get a little involved with our knife work to make that happen. So what we'll do is you'll take off the top and bottom of the lemon, probably about half an inch, but really what you're looking for is the flesh on the inside. So notice here, I made that cut and I didn't quite get to the flesh. Go ahead and make another small slice and continue to do that until you see the flesh of the lemon itself. There we go. From there, take your lemon and put it on one of the cut sides and you're going to use your knife to cut away all of that white pith and expose the flesh inside. Something that I'll do is I'll line up the edge of my blade with the exposed flesh, and that's why we wanna see that. It gives us a little guideline. And if you miss some parts at the bottom, don't worry, you could flip it over and cut it up again. 
Now being very careful, you want to hold your lemon in one hand and then using your knife, you wanna cut in between those little membrane guidelines to remove the segment. And the best way to do this is working over a bowl. That way you catch those segments as they fall out, as well as any of the juices. Now, there's still a lot of juice in this membrane that we have left behind, so go ahead and squeeze that out. That way we can get that flavor into the dish. We worked really hard on those lemon segments, but we're going to work just a little bit harder to remove all of those seeds because I don't wanna eat seeds in my final dish. I don't think you do either. From here, we'll want to season these lemon segments because like I said, Amalfi lemons are a little bit different than the lemons we get here in the States. They're far less sharp and they're a little bit sweeter. So to do that, we'll be seasoning the lemons with a little bit of salt, as well as a little bit of sugar. Give that a little stir and we'll set that aside. Now, like I said, we're working with lemon flavor in layers here. And the next layer comes in the form of grated zest. Now this is the zest of two other lemons and we're going to, again, give it the Amalfi treatment with a little bit of salt, as well as a little bit of sugar. Something that we like to do here is massage the zest with salt or sugar to really express a lot of those oils that is in the zest. And to that, we'll also throw in some olive oil. And we'll give that a little stir. And boom, another layer of lemon flavor done. So finally, we can look at this water that's been bubbling away and we'll pull out all of those lemon zest strips and set them into a bowl. By boiling them, we broke them down. They're a lot softer. And that means we could cut them up nice and fine. So all the zest came out of that supercharged pasta water. Now keep in mind, we are only boiling in two quarts of pasta water here, and that's going to help create a really thick, starchy sauce that's gonna cling to our pasta at the end. And here we're working with store-bought fresh pasta, and we'll throw that right into our water here and cook it for about three minutes, just until it's al dente. So I've drained my pasta, it's nice and al dente, and I've saved about a cup and a half of that liquid to use as the sauce later down the road. From here, we want to build even more layers of flavor, but this time, not with lemon. So here I have a 12-inch skillet set over medium heat. I'm going to bring some olive oil up to temperature. In the meantime, while that heats, I'm going to go ahead and cut up all of the lemon zest that we boiled in the pasta water. You wanna get it fairly fine. We want that lemon flavor dispersed throughout the sauce. We do have a little shimmer going on, so we could go ahead and add in our garlic, as well as our chili flake. We just wanna give that a few moments to become aromatic. Really what you're looking for is when your garlic starts to brown just slightly. And we're already there. So from here, we could go ahead and add in those seasoned lemon segments. And if any of your garlic stuck to the bottom of the pan, the lemon juice is gonna help deglaze and lift that up from the pan itself. Just like the garlic and the chili flake, we only want to cook this until the lemon segments are warmed through. That way we still maintain a little bit of their tang. All right, and from there, we add this directly into our pasta that we returned back into the pot. We're gonna scrape it all out because we don't wanna miss out on any of that flavor. And to this, we're also going to throw in about half a cup of that reserved pasta water. Now, again, the starches that are in that concentrated pasta water is what's going to help create a sauce that's silky and clings to the pasta. We're gonna keep layering that lemon flavor in, again, with that zest that we chopped up. We'll follow that up with the lemon zest that we have sitting in oil. And finally, some parsley, some freshness to bring some other colors into this game. And once again, Toss, toss, toss. So I only added in a half cup of that pasta water. I'm finding that I need a little bit more and that's why we have so much extra on hand. You wanna add it in about a tablespoon at a time just to get the desired sauce consistency. So it's at this point that you wanna go ahead and give it a taste just to see if it needs a little bit of extra salt, extra pepper. Mm. Oh, it's so bright that lemon flavor is really coming through, but it's not too sharp, which I really like. So from here, we could go ahead and plate up. So what I like to do is pull up a nice amount with my tongs and then give both the tongs and the plate a little twist. I think I'm gonna hit this with a little extra Parmesan on top and maybe just one quick glug of olive oil. And there you have it, a beautifully bright citrusy lemon garlic fettuccine. It's bright, it's savory, it has a little bit of a kick, 
What more could you want in a pasta? You can get this recipe as well as all of the other recipes from this season of Milk Street at MilkStreetTV.com. All episodes and recipes from this season of Milk Street Television are available for free at our website, MilkStreetTV.com. Please access our content, including our step-by-step -step recipe videos, from your smartphone, your tablet, or your computer. The new Milk Street Cookbook is now available and includes every recipe from our TV show. From fried shrimp tacos and Thai-style vegetable stir-fry, Mexican chicken soup, and Swedish cardamom buns, the Milk Street Cookbook offers bolder, fresher, simpler recipes. Order your copy of the Milk Street Cookbook for $27, 40% less than the cover price, and receive a Milk Street tote with your order at no additional charge. Call 855-MILK-177 or order online. Funding for this series was provided by the following. That meal. You sauteed, you seared, and you served. Cooking with All Clad. Bonded cookware designed, engineered, and assembled in the USA for over 50 years. All Clad. For all your kitchen adventures.